If I asked you, what is theater, how would you answer? Would you point out that it uses sets, costumes, lights? Maybe you would explain that theater is the performance of a play, a script that was written before rehearsals began. Perhaps you'd say that it's a performance which happens on a stage, with an audience watching. Maybe you'd tell me it's a live performance, something happening in the immediate. And those are all great answers. But they can also be answers to questions about performances we don't call theater. Athletic competitions play out on a type of stage with costumes and lights. Religious services utilize scripts taken from holy texts. Stand-up comedy acts are performed on a stage with a live audience. And all of those examples happen in real time, live, in front of an audience. But if you're like me, it just doesn't feel right to call any of those things theater. Maybe they're theatrical, but they're not theater. Maybe the answer isn't so easy after all. What differentiates theater from other forms of performance depends mostly on the culture of performance that you grew up in. That means there are multiple answers to the question of what is theater, and they're all right to some extent. But regardless of your cultural background, there is a point at which a performance goes from being one thing to being theater. So what is that point? And when did it first appear in the history of human performance? Hi, I'm the theater history professor, and today we're going to take a look back into history to try and explain just what theater is and what makes it distinct from other types of performance. But first, we have to question our own personal biases. Maybe you've experienced theater from perspectives that are similar to my own. Theater that emerges from literature, where the script precedes the performance. Theater that conforms to conventions established in either Europe or North America in the last 150 years or so. Theater that espouses aesthetics developed for audiences in places like New York or London. And theater that aims to meet some commercial or commodified goal. Knowing our own perspectives allows us to ask, if things were done differently, would we still call it theater? It's important to point out that this isn't a qualitative question. It's not about identifying theater that is better or worse. It's about understanding how another culture, from a different place or a different time, utilized performance in ways that, for those people, transformed the thing performed into something distinctly theater. So let's go back in time. A lot of theater histories begin around the fire of ancient humanity. Just imagine it. A single hunter has captured the attention of his group as he recalls the excitement of the hunt earlier that day. He tells the story with his entire body, expressing important moments with changes in the intensity of his voice and mimicking the movements of the animal. The light of the fire flickers off his face as his fellow hunters laugh at the brother who tripped in the mud and cheer for the sister who landed the first spear. It's a compelling image that speaks to how performance enhances human communication and draws us together as a community. But is it theater? What we're talking about is often categorized as storytelling. And maybe you've heard an actor, a director, or a playwright talk about theater as storytelling. But are they the same thing? Well, theater certainly needs a story, we might call it a plot, and someone to tell that story, be that a narrator or a character. And storytelling is an ancient practice that emerges from nearly all human cultures. In fact, many indigenous societies around the world today still place immense importance on storytelling. As Amon Siam and Eric Ritzkis put it, the role of the storyteller is central to the exercise of agency and renewal. In indigenous traditions around the world, storytellers are sacred knowledge keepers. They are the elders and medicine people, and they shape communities through the spoken and written word. Stories are not only agentic and individual, but they are communal sharings that bind communities together spiritually 
and relationally. It seems to me that a lot of what storytelling is and does within a community seems very similar to theater. But I think we need to be careful. Just like we don't want to call a religious service theater, we also don't want to take a word that's rooted in European traditions and apply it to modes of performance from other cultures. So, can we consider storytelling to be a substitute word for theater? Maybe story performing. Close, but even that doesn't feel right. Our terminology just can't capture the nuances that distinguish between theater and other forms of performance, especially as we look across history and geography. In his book, Between Theater and Anthropology, Richard Schechner wrote that there are a number of basic performance theories originating in different cultures, and that when theater people know more about how rituals and traditional performances are transmitted, the problem will be less intractable. Terms like theater, ritual, and performance each reflect aspects of social systems and history that share a lot of overlap, which makes them difficult to untangle. In an article examining the ancient Sanskrit text known as Natya Sastra, Schechner describes the work as a very detailed compendium concerning the religious mythic origins and practices of Natya, a Sanskrit word not easily translatable, but reducible to dance theater music. Unlike European treatises on theater, the most famous of which is Aristotle's Poetics, the Natya Sastra focus, focuses predominantly on the actions and affects of performance rather than the construction of dramatic literature, or what we would call plays. The Natya Sastra is fascinating because it explains how to effectively perform Natya using, of all things, culinary terminology. This ancient treatise uses the Sanskrit word rasa as a way to compare the flavor of a good meal with the experience of watching a moving performance. But what is this thing called the rasa, the text says? Here is the reply. Because it is enjoyably tasted, it is called rasa. How does the enjoyment come? Persons who eat prepared food with different condiments and sauces, if they are sensitive, enjoy the different tastes and then feel pleasure. Likewise, sensitive spectators, after enjoying the various emotions expressed by the actors through words, gestures, and feelings, feel pleasure. This feeling by the spectators is here explained as the rasas of Natya. The Natya Sastra is but one example of how ancient documents describe performance in ways that may seem different to us, but were effective at communicating complex ideas to their historical audiences. Using culinary terminology, the Natya Sastra brilliantly weaves together the sensory experience of theatrical performances that were rooted in storytelling, ritual, religion, and entertainment. And though we largely understand theater today as a secular activity designed for the purposes of entertainment, there's a lot that seems familiar about what Schechner calls the dance theater music performance described in the Natya Sastra. But let's turn to one final example that is probably the most difficult to untangle because of how old it is. Sometime around 1900 BCE, that's almost 4,000 years ago, Pharaoh Senseret II's right-hand man, Ikernifret, raised his stele, an upright stone slab, in the sacred city of Abydos, with the description of an event celebrating the death and resurrection of the god Osiris. On the stele, Ikernifret describes, in the first person, the events of Osiris' story as if he is enacting them or bringing them about. But what is Ikernifret actually doing with the text he has left us on the stele? Is he playing roles in a ritual, or is he simply documenting things he did as a part of a larger festival? Alan Sykes compares the text on the stele to surviving funerary texts from the three different kingdom periods of ancient Egypt in order to better understand what Ikernifret wrote and why he wrote it the way that he did. In the funerary texts, he identifies an Egyptian concept known as Heka, which was the integral substance manifested when naming a person or being, and when invoked in relation to the dead, would reassert their continued existence in the material world. So, when Akernifret speaks about actions performed by Egyptian deities, he is calling forth the Heka of those actions in relation to the Osiris story, bringing to life the power of that story and its connotations connecting the pharaoh with the cycle of Osiris' death and resurrection. And because the stele has survived thousands of years, 
The power of Hecka in Iconifret Stele still speaks today. Iconifret is doing some similar things to what actors do when they, when they portray character, bringing specific, scripted actions to life in order to make real the story of a play. Hecka is the active part of his acting out the story of Osiris, similar to how Aristotle described what actors do as mimesis, or what we might call imitation. Though it's important to note that Sykes is adamant that we should be very careful about calling Iconifret Stile a theatrical text. And that brings us back to where we started, which unfortunately means we haven't really solved the problem of what is theater. We have a better picture of some types of performances that strike us today as theatrical, but it's likely that we'll never really know if it's appropriate to actually call them theater. Nevertheless, using theater as a point of investigation or for comparison helps us better understand what peoples of the past might have been doing in one of the most human of activities, performing stories. And it's exciting to think about how theater will change in the future as we find new and innovative ways to perform stories we can't even imagine today. Thanks for joining me on this episode. I'm Kyle A. Thomas, the theater history professor, and I hope you shatter an ECAP, or whatever it is they say.